freshwater ecosystems are absolutely fundamental to um, human health and well-being. If we don't have fresh water, then human populations are not going to do very well. Um, but unfortunately, because humans depend on freshwater ecosystems so much, we live by rivers, we live by lakes, and unfortunately the pollution that we produce, either from our, our waste and our industry, um, acts to deteriorate water quality. So we always have this kind of tension whereby we're wanting to have pristine freshwater ecosystems to protect the biodiversity, to protect, to protect the water quality that we use for drinking. But equally there's this tension whereby we're using the same water and we're causing it to become uh, uh, polluted. So there's a, a long history of um, human impacts on freshwater. Um, one of the sort of the most important impacts in recent decades has been acid rain. And this is where we're burning fossil fuels uh, for, through car use and for energy production since the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. And that burning of fossil fuels releases um, sulfur into the atmosphere. That combines with uh, precipitation uh, that uh, causes acid rain. And when that acid rain falls on the lake or in a river and is catchment, it causes these uh, lakes and rivers to become acidified. And that's very bad for biodiversity. And what happened, at least in North America and in Europe, um, in the 1960s and 1970s, thousands of lakes started to lose their fish. And that means they were losing their biodiversity. Uh, the fish was important for protein, for humans eating it. it was, they were important for um, recreation, but also important in terms of the food web structure and freshwater ecosystem in general. And so there's a big problem to try and identify so what was causing the acidification to happen. Um, and then in the 1980s, these sort of large international uh, projects started that sort of pinpointed the acidification was caused by pollution. And then that meant that uh, governments around the world put into policies that they ended up reducing sulfur emissions from fossil fuel burning. Um, it's very successful. By over 90% we reduced sulfur. Um, and that meant that the chemistry of the lake started to return to normal. But the biology hasn't returned yet, and we don't quite know why there's a, a delay in this. Um, humans also cause an impact in fresh waters through agriculture as well. And all the fertilizers we produce on the land for growing crops, that agriculture, that sort of phosphate and nitrates, they seep into the soil, that seeps into the rivers, and that seeps into the lake. And that's bad for lakes, again. So what happens with agricultural contaminants is that we get initially uh, an, an increase in sort of nitrogen and phosphorus causes these algae to start blooming and that might be sort of quite good but only temporarily but when the algals bloom they take up all the oxygen uh, so they produce lots of oxygen and then when the algae die they start to respire and all the oxygen is used up and that creates dead zones in, in lakes which means that there's no oxygen left for the animals or the fish and so again the fish then start to die out and so a lot of work is trying to uh, clean up lakes and rivers to try and stop us producing so much agricultural contamination feeding uh, in, in, into these freshwater ecosystems. Um, sewage from humans uh, is another Im important waste uh, and especially where you have an increase in tourism in industry for example and in, and in remote regions and, and, a, and a, an important example of this at the moment is in Lake Baikal. So while Lake Baikal is generally actually quite pristine in terms of its uh, contamination in the last 10 years, it's been realized that in the, in the coastal regions of the lake, we're seeing this kind of this algae that's being produced more and more, that's causing this scum to, uh, sort of scum is a very technical word, but this kind of a horrible algal blooms to appear on, on the coast of Lake Baikal. That's very smelly as well. And then when the algae starts to die out, then the auction is used up. And then we're seeing kind of like uh, the death of some animals in Lake Baikal around the coastal regions. And it's only in the last maybe three or four years that we're kind of realizing that these kind of like algal blooms are occurring nearby villages and towns, especially those that have increased tourism. And because a lot more people are going to, for example, Lake Baikal, then the, the, the sewage is not being treated properly. So it's entering into the lake and that's not good because it's causing pollution of the lake. 
so the water quality is not good and that's causing algal blooms to happen. And so now there's a lot of work uh, uh, going on in Russia to try to uh, increase kind of regulation and to try to increase the, the better infrastructure around the lake to uh, prevent this uh, sewerage. Um, another very dangerous um, uh, or sort of negative consequence of human impact on freshwater ecosystems come from what we call invasive species. Now, invasive species are species that uh, get into a lake or a river where they haven't really existed there before. And a common way of doing that is when uh, uh, um, some person in an authority might think, OK, I want better fish in this lake. So they'll introduce a fish from another country and they'll introduce it into that lake uh, to improve fishing, to improve uh, industry and improve the economy, for example. And so perhaps the classic example of that is in Lake Victoria in, in East Africa, in, in Uganda. Um, and there, so, so Lake Victoria is, is another kind of uh, ancient lake. Um, and up until the 1940s, it had uh, about 600 species of uh, uh, unique fish, endemic fish called cichlids. Um, so it's a very biodiverse, uh, rich region. And then in the early 1950s, um, one of the uh, endemic, another fish called tilapia, started to die out. And so the British, who were having colonial rule at the time in Uganda, they introduced the Nile perch because they wanted to improve the fisheries there. And it was disastrous. So in a, number, in a matter of decades, Lake Victoria lost over 200 of its species of these endemic fish which is probably one of the biggest uh, extinction uh, 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 declines in the 20th century. Um, so while the null perch increased in number because it had no enemies, it had nothing to, to who, who would kill the null perch off, and it fed on other fish. So it just bloomed, it just grew in numbers massively. So the fishing industry became very important there. So in terms of local economies, it increased a lot. And in terms of food security, it increased a lot. But in terms of freshwater security, it killed off all the other fish, a lot of them at least. Um, local fisher people, they lost their livelihoods because they were that was based on the, the local endemic fish. And so industrialization of the economy happened there. And that had sort of lots of negative consequences. And now they're sort of trying to find a balance really between having sort of an, an industrial fisheries there, but also kind of sort of local community style fisheries there. And so again, we're sort of seeing, you know, after the 1950s, yeah, lots of industrialization things happening. Now we're kind of seeing a reversal of that and sort of trying to manage things that are sort of, you know, better for sort of local economies as well. But that's quite a hard thing to do with these uh, freshwater ecosystems. When we looked at the acid rain falling on lakes, and because a lot of that pollution, say, in Europe, like Britain was called the dirty man of Europe because it was producing pollution that was being blown across into Scandinavia and that was causing the lakes in Scandinavia to become acidified and so and then Scandinavia were losing their fish. It needed legislation from, from uh, lots of countries coming together, so it needed international legislation. And so the, the, the Europe and United Nations, for example, from 1979 up until the late 1980s, put into place several, uh, several laws that told countries you had to limit the amount of sulfur that was in your, the fossil fuel that you were burning. So you had to you know, sort of produce cleaner fossil fuel, basically. Um, and that meant that because sulfur emissions reduced by 95% over 30, 40 years, that started to have less acid rain and that, therefore, then the lake started to recover. So by having international cooperation from scientists, working with people, sort of stakeholders and actors who are, who are dependent upon the, the lakes themselves and other freshwaters, and working across with policymakers across different governments, then I think you can produce really effective legislation. Sometimes it's more difficult. So something like... Um, agricultural impact on, on lakes and rivers. Um, because that's driven by European policy, uh, it's, it's, it's quite hard at the local level to change it. But you could have an example whereby um, you could have a farm that's in a lake. You could tell the farmer just to stop dumping 
the, the waste that comes from its cows into the river. And if you do that, then the river becomes cleaner and then the lake, which rivers flow into the lake, that will become cleaner as well. So there are kind of local steps you can take to uh, remediate the, the fresh water. There are international legislation steps you can take to remediate the, the fresh water. Um, perhaps the most difficult thing to stop is when you have something like an invasive species coming into the lake, like we have in Lake Victoria in the Nile Perch. Because you can never get rid of the Nile Perch now. It is going to be now there for good. So the, the ecosystem has changed and you just have to live with that and then try to manage it to the, 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 you know, what's optimal for all concerned.